Welcome to In Chamber, the podcast. I'm your host, Tom Schumann. This is episode two of season three of what was formerly known as the Echo Chamber. We've evolved beyond the Echo Chamber, but we'll continue to bring you conversations that will educate and entertain. I'm most confident of that statement considering today's guest. I won't name all of her many accomplishments because that because that would take the majority of our time. She is, however, the former interim chair of the Democratic National Committee, currently an adjunct professor, best-selling author, syndicated columnist, television commentator, and simply one of the most influential figures in American politics over the last 40-plus years. Donna Brazil, thank you for joining us, and welcome to the In Chamber. It's my great honor. Thank you so much. Well, Donna, you'll be appearing with Dana Perino at the Chamber's 30th Annual Awards Dinner on November 7th. We had the opportunity to talk with Dana a few weeks ago on our season opening episode. Uh, If you would, what what do you respect most about your Republican counterpart, Dana Perino? Well, I've known Dana for well over 15 years. We first met, not under the best of circumstances, but nevertheless, we did get a chance to get to know one another. It was during the time of Hurricane Katrina uh, taking place down in my beloved Gulf Coast state of Louisiana. Uh, Dana was at the White House, and I went over to the White House to meet with President Bush along with uh, other uh, leaders to discuss the uh, recovery efforts and also efforts to rebuild my beloved home state and Gulf region. Uh, I found Dana and many others in the Bush administration to be open to not only my ideas, but open to my participation in working with them to to ensure that we had uh, adequate support and uh, resources to to build uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, and the Gulf Coast. So uh, she and I uh, became friends, and uh, I I just love her company. Well, the... The two of you make these appearances that you've done it in other places before various groups. When you're together talking to a business audience, what's uh, some of the messages that you strive to communicate? Well, we we talk about uh, not just uh, the political environment that exists today in American politics, but we also like to go beyond politics to talk about things that we share in common. Uh, We both love uh, the outdoors. Uh, she is a dog owner, uh, the mother of Jasper. I used to uh, have a, a little Pomeranian named Chip Chip. Uh, Dana and I both lived on Capitol Hill. We have uh, great uh, stories from our time working uh, for the United States Congress, the House of Representatives. So we, we tend to talk a, a lot about, uh, you know, the a, a little bit of everything because – uh, she is such a respected and, and, and well-read uh, person that I enjoy just being in her company, learning from her, listening to her. And, of course, uh, we try to make sense out of what's going on in Washington, <laughs> D.C., which is sometimes hard to do. So, I guess I sometimes a tall order there, but uh, I'm glad we have the two of you uh, working on, on making sense of all that. Uh, I've got a question about similarities, but before that, you, you talked about Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans, the, the Louisiana region. Fourteen years ago, talk, uh, give a little sense from your view, the, the progress uh, and what that's been made and kind of the rebirth that's taking place in that area. Well, we, we are uh, undergoing a rebirth, a revival, a renaissance, whatever you want to call it, but it's also still... Uh, a city that is trying to get back totally on its feet. As you well know, uh, not only did Hurricane uh, Katrina bring widespread damage, uh, flooding, but uh, a few weeks after Katrina made landfall in the Gulf, uh, here come another storm, Rita, which also devastated the western part of the state uh, close to our Texas border. And so we have spent years trying to improve not only the infrastructure, but with the, the support that we received from not just the federal government, but uh, the re- support we've received from nonprofits and others, we've been able to, to uh, really rebuild in, in ways that I was, uh, in, in many ways, I was uh, certainly uh, surprised to see our infrastructure. As I mentioned, we have a, a world-class uh, level one trauma center now. We have a new VA hospital. 
uh, we're still uh, making uh, what I call positive improvements in terms of education. Uh, we're, we're trying to build out from a tourism economy to a biotechnology uh, economy, uh, using our ports, using all the other advanced resources we have in the region. So we're, we're coming back better, stronger, uh, and smarter than we were prior to Hurricane Katrina. But it is a lengthy process, though, as we've said, it's already, and the work must continue in that area. Yeah, Donna, I'm not, even, I'm not even sure you're aware of it. At this annual dinner event, we are going to honor two former Indiana senators, Democrat Birch Bayh and Republican Richard Luger, by naming our Government Leader of the Year Award after them. So you were talking about similarities earlier, besides their many accomplishments, I'd say one of the similarities for both of them was bringing the bipartisanship, the civility to the table. Senator Bayh, of course, was a driving force behind Title IX. Do you have some recollections uh, of the former Indiana senators? Well, I, I uh, got a chance to, to know both of them. In fact, at, at the last DNC meeting, I sponsored a resolution honoring the work and achievement of uh, Senator Bai. Of course, I know his son very well. But what a great American, both Americans. Uh, I, I got to know Senator Luger a little bit better during the Obama administration and, of course, the Bush administration. He was willing to work with President Obama on, on uh, nuclear pro- proliferation and other foreign policy challenges. President Obama found him to be a good colleague, not only when he was in the Senate, but also as president. Uh, and, of course, uh, I am a Title IX child. I, I came of age after the passage of Title IX, and as a former athlete, uh, someone who benefited from the rules changes in Title IX that made sure that all of our schools and institutions receiving federal funds gave women and girls an opportunity to uh, advance their education or play sports in my case. Uh, I am proud of both of their their work, their achievement. But, you know, we have forgotten something. When you mention their names, when you mention names like uh, Mr. Bai and Mr. Luger, you think about bipartisanship, you think about cooperation, you think about compromise. You also think about the common good and looking for ways to make legislation stronger. Uh, and, and, you know, back when I was a congressional staff staffer, at the end of the day, once the Democrats, I'm a Democrat, once we finish our work, uh, we were always told to go and talk to our Republican colleagues about the changes we would make so that the next day before we went to markup, uh, we had some ideas of the amendments to some of the concerns that the Republicans had. We didn't consider them to be poison pill. We can consider them to make the bill stronger and better uh, so that when we reach the floor, we would have, you know, bipartisan support. We've lost that in American politics. I think that's a grave mistake because ultimately the only way to get the only way to get things done, and, and it, especially in this political environment, is to, is to reach across the aisle and to, uh, to find common ground to see if we need an extra, say, period, question mark, comma, whatever it may be, uh, extra phrase, uh, perhaps less money, more money, whatever the case may be. But the fact t- today that when you work across the aisle, you're demonized and you're told that that's bad politics because you might uh, get a primary, I think ultimately that's going to hurt our democracy and hurt our ability to get things done in the future. Is there a secret to, to changing that? Anything you can offer, suggest? How, how do we get back to that bipartisanship that is so important and to, to our efforts? Well, it, it has to come from the American people, the voters themselves. We need to understand that we need less money in politics, not more money. The more money we have, the more private or special interests that get involved and say, I want a candidate that represents my views and my corporation or my business or my concerns and and ignore the concerns of others. I think the best way to handle this is to get more voters involved in the political process so that we can uh, not only, uh, you know, support and, and, and help drive the conversation, but make sure that we have men and women of valor we're willing to listen to the other side, learn from them, and to try to make improvements in how we strengthen all our democratic institutions. Today, if I turn on one channel, I'm getting one point of view. Then I turn on another channel, I get another point of view. Last night, I watched three 
different political channels just to figure out what was going on. And, of course, I ended up watching the Weather Channel because I'm more concerned <laughs> about what's going on with Dorian than I am about anything else right now. Absolutely. Well, Donna, as expected, you're making my job easier because I, I got a follow up here and you just led me to it perfectly. I saw a comment from you earlier this year regarding voter apathy. It said, quote, the more passionate people on either side are raising money and raising hell. The majority in the middle are just not engaged. Along with that, we have Arthur Brooks, you know, formerly of the American Enterprise Institute. He was a guest at a chamber event earlier this year. And on this podcast, he talked about the 7% who were out to benefit or profit from the disarray taking place in Washington. What will it take to change that, to elevate the engagement of that, as you said, the majority in the middle? Well, we need every democratic institution, and I say democratic, I'm meaning small d, every political, every nonprofit, every institution and government and society to work together to raise the level of what I call civic discourse. Most Americans don't understand how a bill become law. Most Americans don't even understand how members of Congress are elected. Most Americans don't even believe that they're qualified to serve in public office. We have hundreds of thousands of, of positions that need filled, that, that must be filled every two or four years, and yet most Americans sit on the sideline and, and don't think it's important. We need everyday Americans to just believe that this is part of their civic obligation. We, we owe something to a country like ours to give back, to pay it forward, to ensure that the next generation of Americans are prepared to serve and to lead our great country. You know, I'm, I'm back teaching this semester at Georgetown, my 18th year. I tell my friends it's the least amount of money but the greatest amount of joy to be a, a college, a part-time college professor. I'm also at Howard University organizing lecture series where I bring in both Republicans and Democrats because I believe that we can strengthen our arguments by bringing in both sides. I mean, what are the big topics of today? Well, we are worried about our economy. Uh, are we slowing down? Uh, are we going to remain competitive? Can we get a trade agreement with China and other countries? All of these issues require bipartisan solutions. Uh, can we fix our broken criminal justice system? Can we, can we make improvements to our education system so that employees are not you know, looking abroad to find talent, we can find it right in our own backyard if we are making sure that we invest in and 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 the skills and and the uh, resources that we need in the future. So there are so many things that that we should focus on as Americans. I tend to 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 try to treat everybody with respect, to try to you know empower people to make a difference, but most importantly. I try to listen, because by listening, I learn. And if I stop listening, well, guess what? Then I close my mind and, and, right. and don't hear the other views. Absolutely. You know, Donna, you're also a strong advocate about the need for more opportunities for women to serve in office. In, in general, I'd say Democrats have done a better job than Republicans of preparing women and, and, and electing them to office. Do you agree with that? And if so, why do you think that's the case? Well, as a Democrat, we have made this a priority. I, I, I read something this morning, and I tweeted it out, and I also sent it to my students. We also uh, need to ensure that Republican women are doing the same thing, and i tell you why. Uh, if you go back in history, 99 years ago, the women who were on the front line, uh, the front lines advocating for suffrage, they were Republicans as well as Democrats. Uh, if you look out throughout history, we've had Republicans as well as Democrats advocating for uh, equal rights and more representation of women in American politics. I, one of the books that I encourage my students to read is called A Seat at the Table, where we look at the experience of, uh, experiences of women, whether they're in Congress or in state legislature, uh, state legislators, and we say, okay, what difference have they made? And they've made a great deal of difference. If you look at what Patty Murray and Susan Collins did in trying to end the government shutdown uh, last year, when you look at ways in which women lawmakers are trying to tackle some of the big issues of our time, it's important that women have a seat at the table. Why? Because we're not only half of the population, we're the majority of college graduates, we're the majority of voters. It makes sense. 
common sense to have women fulfill their civic obligations and their civic responsibilities by being at the at the table as well. Donna, it's uh, it's still early, some would say, in the two, 2020 presidential race where you, you can't necessarily win the race yet, but a misstep might cost a, a candidate the opportunity to compete later. Do you have some thoughts on, on some of the, the candidates and, and some of the women c- competing at the top levels on the, on the Democratic side? Well, uh, you know, we are still shopping. Uh, we started off with over... Uh, two dozen candidates, and now we're we're down to uh, I think uh, twenty. Uh, it, it's it's still a long way before we whittle this process down to maybe uh, less than a dozen. But I'm excited by the feel. I know that uh, uh, we're looking at the polls and we're looking at the positioning and policy proposals. I like to look at leadership, the characteristics that I think. Uh, the American people are looking for somebody who's honest, somebody who will uh, stand up and represent us. But I think after the last three years, we really need somebody who would try to heal our divisions, not exploit them, uh, and not use our divisions as a way to uh, create uh, distinctions without a difference. So I, I, I am totally open to all of the candidates who are running on the Democratic side, um, and I think that the women who are in the race, the largest group of women ever to seek the nomination, I, I'm excited that I believe one or two of them will end up in the final four. Well, Donna, certainly some of our listeners here know that you were a campaign manager for Al Gore in 2000. A couple of questions related to that. What, if anything, kind of stays with you from that historical election? Well, I still believe that when it comes to uh, our election infrastructure in our country, it is not uh, a gold standard. It is still uh, perhaps bronze. We need to improve our election infrastructure. We need to make sure that every vote, uh, whether you have uh, a paper ballot or a machine, uh, every vote is counted. Every voter is treated with respect, uh, with no long lines in certain neighborhoods or precincts. We need to ensure that there's no longer voter intimidation, voter suppression that fails to address the, the problems that certain people have when they, when they try to cast their ballots. What sticks with me also is that when it was finally over, when the Supreme Court ruled in favor of uh, President, uh, then Governor George W. Bush, my ex-boss, my former boss and good friend Al Gore, uh, told me to shut it down, meaning shut down the campaign. We were not going to continue the campaign. Instead, we had to help prepare for the next president of the United States. We, we, we sort of missed that. I, I think people forgot that after that election, Al Gore uh, went back home to Tennessee to build a very successful career uh, as an advocate for climate change and, and continued his, his uh, important work. Uh, and he didn't, decided not to run in 2004. He helped to rally the country along with many others like Ted Kennedy, the late uh, senator from Massachusetts, to work with President Bush on a number of initiatives after 9-11 because the country had to come together. Here we are today, some three years after we all know or should know that the Russians launched a cyber attack on our country, and we're still not together. We're still pointing fingers. We're still uh, in denial uh, over what happened in 2016. But I do believe at the end of the day that we are going to improve our election infrastructure, that we are going to have the very best of elections in 2020 and beyond, because I, uh, I think that there are good people over at the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, working with state and local election officials, Secretary of State, to improve the way we vote in 2020. Yeah, my second question related to that, and I know your experience in the process goes back well beyond, but 2000, but how much do you feel that that presidential process has changed, uh, whether it's over these last 20 years or, or even beyond? What are some of the differences that you see? 
Well, technology has changed the way we communicate with each other. Now we look for per- persuadable voters based on their social media habits. I mean, back in the day, we went door to door knocking to make sure that we knew who Jane and John Doe were and talked to them. Uh, we use social media in ways to weaponize uh, conversations and communications to create a subset of voters that we believe are, you know, our voters as opposed to just simply Americans. Uh, technology clearly is going to continue to sharpen the way we make distinctions, uh, again, without a difference, but how we divide people. Uh, the second thing is that, you know, the candidates today, I mean, look, I love all of the candidates running. I know most of them, but let's be honest and let's be frank. Uh, some of these candidates are running. They don't have a, a shot to win. They, they're at 1%. They've been stuck at 1% now for six months. They've been exposed on television. They've been they participated in at least two nationally televised debates. They've had town hall meetings. They've been to all of the early states, Iowa, New Hampshire, uh, South Carolina, Nevada, and yet they're still running. Why? So uh, we have a long way to go in in improving uh, the quality of candidates and and the quality of information. But you know what? It's America. It's American politics. And everybody believes they have a a chance to win. And because of that, I'm just going to sit back like every American and have some popcorn and, in my case, red (laughs) wine and watch them. And see, see how things play out, huh? Absolutely. May, may, I, 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 you know, with 10, with 10 presidential candidate campaigns under my belt, seven as a staffer, uh, a campaign manager, a chair of a political party, uh, a major political party, I think it's, 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 it's now just a great honor to sit back and watch it uh, and to go to class once or twice a week and talk to my students about it so that I can encourage them one day to perhaps get, put their feet in the pond and, and decide to stand for office. So is a presidential campaign process maybe the, the, the one true actual reality show that, that, that plays out in real life as compared you to know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I think every time I turn on my TV, and I am grateful to God that I have over 170 channels, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it gets worrisome sometimes to just watch TV, and it's all negative news. It's all negative information. And I'm not just talking about the days that we had to deal with mass shootings and stuff like that, or, or, or weather. I'm talking about just regular conversations that we hear on television. I mean, how often do you watch television and learn something? I mean, it's rare, unless you have time for 60 Minutes on a Sunday or some of the other uh, programs that give you more in-depth coverage. It, it's all about the sound bite. It's about the superficial, not the substance. And I don't know how much we're learning uh, when we're watching television. That's why I I still subscribe to several newspapers, and I I spend each day trying to read the news, understand the news, understand what this whole tariff thing is about, understand what's going on with Brexit, understand what's happening in other parts of the world so that I am more informed when I go on television and I can tell the viewers. For example, I've been studying this whole uh, ceasefire, uh, this this so-called peace plan to reduce the number of troops in Afghanistan. I spent two days trying to dig deep, deep, going to Doha to read all of the quote-unquote, local news and and finding out what the Taliban is doing or not doing. And I tell you, it makes you more informed when when you're on television and you can talk about that as well as the protests in in Hong Kong, uh, uh, the missile tests that are still going on in in, uh, North Korea. Uh, Look, I know it's exhausting to read a lot, but you know what? It makes you a better informed person when you're out there talking to people or communicate with people. I'm looking at the underlying issues right now in our economy, the manufacturing sector slowing down first in the Midwest, now in the Southeast. I'm looking at the, uh, the, the you know, what's happening with, with uh, our farmers. What I worry about, and, you know, I, I come from a state that has a lot of agriculture uh, interests, uh, but what I worry about is, is that we're, we're putting our farmers on the sideline, and mean, meanwhile, Russia and China are putting together a pact to basically 
uh, you know, supply each other with some of the, the products that we used to supply China with. China is one of the biggest markets for soybeans, and if we're not able to supply that, what are we, what are we to tell our soybean farmers? So I, I, I spend a lot of time reading because I want to make sure that I can inform people and also point out some of the things uh, that I disagree with the president, but not disagree with President Trump, the person, but President Trump's policies, because I worry he doesn't have a end game in his negotiations that will give our farmers, our agriculture sector, a, an advantage in these uh, def, uh, these negotiations. So that's what I try to do. Yeah, you know, Donna, you mentioned the television and the, and the, the different messages that are out there T- today. Among your many roles, you are a contributor to Fox News. Why did you make the decision to, to kind of take your message to the Fox News audience? Well, first of all, I, I consider it to be a great opportunity. I spent more than 14 years at CNN. I've been with ABC. I, I will still go back uh, on ABC several times a year. Uh, I've been on MSNBC. I've been around. I, I, I've done a little bit of everything in my life, and I'm still going to do a lot more. Uh, but I thought this was a great opportunity to go back to a network uh, that didn't hire me back uh, when CNN picked me up in 2001, 2002. Fox was just getting on their feet. And CNN really put together this amazing concept of having different uh, different political uh, strategists on on air from both political parties, and I was on with Babe Buchanan, uh, Mary Matlin for many many years on CNN, and so Fox gave me this opportunity, and I thought, you know what, maybe this is like going back to the basics where you can have people from opposing parties uh, who can come on air and to give the viewers. Uh, you know, just their, their partisan viewpoints. That's what we are. We're pundits or uh, political commentators. We have flavor, but we're not the sauce. And I just thought this was a great opportunity for me uh, also to be on a network that, that is uh, much more conservative, and it gives me an opportunity to uh, listen but also uh, and learn, but also give uh, my own, uh, what I call my own special flavor. Donna, you talked about uh, interactions with Senator By certainly earlier. How about any previous experiences you have in Indiana that stand out to you, whether part of any campaigns or, or other opportunities in the in the Hoosier State? Well, Julia Carson was a great friend of mine. I loved her. Uh, she was just special. Uh, I've been to Indiana several times uh, this year. I was up in uh, Lake County, Gary, Indiana, for the Indiana Black Expo. A few weeks ago, I attended the uh, Urban League Conference. I saw the governor. Uh, we, we laughed about the culture versus the saints. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I started uh, this year at the MLK Holiday uh, at uh, down in Evansville, uh, University of, uh, of uh, Indiana down there. Uh, so I, I, I've had several experiences this year. I try to come to Indiana at least two or three times a year because I have friends there, and it's just a good place to, to visit. So, uh, I, of course, uh, uh, when, I, when I often come, I, I, I get in trouble because uh, I like your food, uh, and uh, I also like Indiana football. So um, when you're not playing the Saints uh, or uh, in a basketball, of course, uh, who can ever forget Indiana basketball? But I love the state. I think it's a great state, and I'm looking forward to coming back uh, this fall. Well, excellent. Just a couple things as we wrap up. Uh, we've talked about some of your many roles. You've shared how you, you're a reader. Uh, you delve into topics. But in any spare time that you might have, what, what are some other things you like to do? Well, I love to garden. I have uh, uh, okra. My okra is now coming into full view. I have peppers, all kinds of peppers, red peppers, hot peppers, jalapeno peppers, regular bell peppers. My tomatoes didn't do so well this year, I think, because we've had an awful lot of rain in D.C., my cucumbers, my squash. But I have various uh, uh, shrubs, flowering shrubs, uh, hydrangeas, uh, of course, azaleas. Uh, people tell me when they walk by my house, they like my garden. I like I like the dirt. I like the earth. I like to dig and 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 make things, create things. 
it gives me so much happiness. Uh, I also like to paint. Uh, uh, I'm not a good painter. My daddy was a great mm-hmm. artist. I, I didn't inherit anything from him, but I try. Uh, and, you know, I, I try to go to the dollar store to buy it so I don't waste paint. I, I'm also good with my hands in terms of uh, I like to create projects. For example, I went and found a palette at a hardware store. I drilled it into my uh, wall in my garage, and I made, uh, like, uh, a, a bookshelf for all of my uh, gardening tools. So I have a very creative mind. I'm not one of these uh, uh, women that sit around uh, and do nothing. I wish I learned how to knit or sew, but I didn't. My sisters did. I like to cook. I'm a Creole cook, a Cajun cook, and an everyday cook. If you can smell it, I can cook it. If you can <laughs> taste it, I can burn it. And, you know, I just, I, I love life. I love every good thing that God has provided us on this good earth. And, uh, I tell you one thing I want to do. I want to get another dog. I lo- I miss my dog, Chippity Chippity Gumdrop, a Pomeranian. Dana, Dana and I went walking her dog Jasper down Broadway Street, <laughs> and I had to stop traffic because uh, Jasper decided to, uh, you know, exercise his uh, his right do to do what he needed to do, huh? Right. Uh, but I now it's been two years, and so I just uh, applied. Uh, to adopt a rescue dog. Uh, One of my good friends adopted one in Mississippi. I think it's time to bring another dog in my house, in my life. Uh, I miss my puppy. So uh, I'm I'm looking at getting a dog. And and just I'm I'm looking forward to spending this fall. I turned 60 at the end of the year. So uh, this is my 50th anniversary of being in American politics. I started at the age of nine. I'm excited about uh, I'm excited about that. I, I spent a lot of time at home in Louisiana. Uh, Seventeen nieces and nephews. I don't want them to grow t- so old that I don't remember their youth. So I um, I've been you know going home a lot just to hang out with them and and just you know be more present in their lives uh, as uh, I get older and they they also get older. Don, a final question, and it's clear from what you just described, you are you are living life to the fullest. But th- this is the question, of the kind of the the big picture for listeners this year that we ask all of our our guests. You think about working and career and life and, and, and different things. What does success mean to you? For me personally, it means giving back, honoring my parents, honoring their legacy. My mother was a maid. My father was a janitor. They worked very hard, extremely hard, to raise nine children, nine Catholic kids. I try to give back and pay it forward. You know, every time I earn, uh, I get a paycheck, I should say, I try to send money back home. I try to send money to my church because I know that they feed the homeless and those who are having a difficult time. I try to empty out my pantry before food go bad, to bring to the food bank. Um, I try to go in my closet because I know I will never wear size 10 jeans, uh, 12 or whatever again. I try to pass that on. Uh, For me, that is what's important, is to honor the legacy of those who made a way or paved the path for me. That is success. And being a humble Christian servant, I am... Uh, I am a creature of of the Lord. I, I love the Lord. I love the Lord with all my heart, and I try to be a good. I try to live uh, in ways that I can ask for forgiveness because I've made mistakes in my life. I'm always sorry if I've hurt someone. I try to send uh, notes of gratitude. And um, I try to live uh, so that my nieces and nephews will follow my example one day. And ultimately, I try to uh, uh, instill in them a drive uh, to to, al- to always be optimistic and hopeful uh, and to stay away from negative people and negative things that will uh, at times turn them away from God and turn them away from each other. Well, Donna, thank you so much for your time, sharing your insights with our audience today. And as mentioned, we especially look forward to hearing from you and and Dana Perino on November the 7th. 
Well, I look forward to sharing my story, and I look forward to coming back to the great state of Indiana, and I'm just going to ask a favor. Do not put those chicken wings in front of me or some of that good beef that I've had. I'm going to try to be on a diet when I come there and just <laughs> drink some water. How is that? And I'm sure the governor and I are going to make a bet on something called football, but well, who knows? I might win this time. Well, you know, and I believe, if my memory serves correctly, the Colts travel to New Orleans in December of this year. For, and, and, it may, and it may good. even be a Monday night game. I'm not sure on that. So we'll have that to, to consider when you're here in November. Well, I'll say go Hoosiers until I get there, and then I'll say go Saints because I'm not <laughs> going to let the Colts beat the Saints. But I am going to say I love the Hoosier basketball team, but when it comes to football, I am a diehard Saints fan. Uh, we, 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 can't, uh, we can't take that from you. But Okay, Donna, again, thank you so much for joining us. God bless you, and God bless the people of Indiana. Thank you. Thank you. And as a reminder that the 30th Annual Awards Dinner is November 7th at the Indiana Convention Center. We'll be presenting our four annual awards uh, today upon the release of this podcast is when we are announcing who our business leader of the year is, the, the fourth of those honors. Uh, previous honors were announced earlier this month, so you can find information on who those winners are at indianachamber.com and also additional information about the awards event. We look really look forward to as many of you joining us as possible on November 7th. Once again, we thank Donna Brazil for, for her uh, wonderful insights and stories today and, and look forward to hearing more from her. Thank you, as always, for listening to In Chamber. We'll be back with our next conversation in two weeks. Thank you.